Hello, 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 everybody. It is so good to see all of your digital non-existent faces in the chat. Welcome to God Killer First Blood, the very, very special live studio recording of the first two episodes of our official God Killer First Blood podcast series. Hello. Before I get a little bit too ahead of myself, some introductions are in order. Hi, I'm going to be your game master and creative producer for tonight. My name is Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me across the internet, notably Twitter and the clock app at by Connie Chong. B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-C-H-A-N-G and when I'm not doing this with God Killer, I am also the uh, game master and creative producer for Transplaner RPG, which is the Twitch channel that you're watching right now. We are an odd transgender POC led dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original non-colonial anti-orientalist multiverse. And I'm going to now pass introductions over to my God Killer for the evening, C. Thomas. Hello everybody. I am your god killer for this evening. My name is C. I use they, them pronouns. You can find me making very trans, very gay art on the internet at Pie Sharp Art. Tonight I have the absolute pleasure of playing uh, Rune, Ruination. He uses they, Z pronouns. And I am so excited for you to meet them and to see this incredible system that Connie has been building for the last two years. And I am beyond honored to be your very first god killer. Let's kill some gods, shall we? Yes, let's kill some gods, shall we? Uh, and because I realized I didn't do this in the waiting room, see, let's start recording on Audacity now. Ooh, because y'all are going to be our live studio audience for this. Uh, I'm literally so excited. So I'm going to press the big, big red button now, and let's do a quick clap sync together to make our lives easier in the future. So three, two, one. So welcome one and all to the very special live recording of God Killer First Blood. This is an immensely special game that I'm so excited to share with all of you and the world at large. So thank you so much for being here. God Killer would not be possible without the support of all of you beautiful queer and trans heretics. So if you don't already know, God Killer is an original holy punk PBTA game created by yours truly, built to tell the story of one player, the God Killer, and one game master the god of gods. Together, the god and god killer will weave a mythic, violent, and transformative tale about a single mortal rising against the challenges of the divine. So pre-orders for the Ashcan edition of God Killer are open now. They're literally live right now. Pre-orders are. So you can nab your own copy while they're still on sale. They have a like 25% discount while they're in pre-orders and get ready for the release of the full Ashcan in June 2023. So use exclamation point god killer in chat to get your very own act of heresy. And now I'm going to pass things over to C. Yes, please. Now, a little bit about what this stream in, is in particular before we get started. God Killer First Blood is a prestige podcast series that follows Rune, Z, who ate the devil through the cradle as they learn what it means to destroy the divine and live beyond it. Tonight, we are recording the first two episodes of First Blood right here, right now, live for all of you to enjoy. This is the very first playtest of God Killer featuring all the new mechanics, origins, and moves that'll be featured in the ash can that Connie just told you about. So sit back and enjoy as we discover together how Rune, a rebellious heretic from the dirt poor mining district of Iron 42, kills their very first god. If you like the story, you're in luck because podcast episodes of First Blood will release weekly on Tuesdays and Thursdays starting March 2nd with deliciously crafted edits, background music, and a healthy dose of SFX. Use exclamation point First Blood in the chat to learn even more, and I will pass it right back to Connie. Yes, back to me. A quick correction. Uh, we'll start on May 2nd, not March 2nd of, of the podcast. That's already happened in the past. That's the April Fool's joke uh, part of this. Uh, but yes, uh, moving on. Because I am such a generous and kind god, uh, First Blood isn't the only way for all of you to consume god killer content before the ash can is released in June. So every Saturday from literally this Saturday right now until the end of May, so Saturday, May 20th, we will be hosting god killer one shots right here on this Twitch channel. Channel, featuring seven pairs of gods and god-killing guests. We are the first pair, and every single participant is a true titan of TTRPGs, and I cannot wait to reveal who they are week to week. Who knows, maybe your faves will even be playing this game live on stream right here on Transplaner. So make sure you come back next week, same time, same place, Saturday at 8, to see B. Dave Walters and Miss Gina Darling take on their very own version of the Cradle and find out if it's possible for a god-killer to escape hell. 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so speaking of support for God Killer, we have some incredible sponsors for First Blood and the One Shot series. As you can see from our overlay, ooh, ah, look at the colors, look at all this. We are using Roll, uh, R-O-L-E, to bring you this God Killer One Shot. And it has never been easier to customize your games online with this awesome virtual tabletop. Like everything you're seeing right now, the stuff to the right, like this chat box thing, these, these video cams, it's all Roll, it's all native to Roll. I'm basically just screen capping like the actual software of Roll. Uh, so check out Roll app at rollapp.com and make sure you use exclamation point sponsors in the chat to start running your own games on Roll and get some info on our other sponsors, Start Playing Games and Magpie Games, of course. And now passing it back to you, see? Oh God, I was trying desperately to figure out how to remember to spell sponsors in the chat. I don't even know if I did it right. Uh, finally, everyone, God Killer First Blood is a dark fantasy series that contains content that may be triggering to some viewers. Content warnings for this episode include fantasy violence, gore, body horror, classism, poverty, immolation and fire, death of loved ones, heights, falling, vast and unknowable depths, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, and references to child labor, carceral oppression, and cannibalism. Use exclamation point CW in chat at any time to get a full list of this, these content warnings. And now, without further ado, I will throw it over to Connie to get us started on the actual session itself. Let's do it. And again, please do review those content warnings and take them seriously. Uh, this is a dark, <laughs> This is a dark fantasy game. It is very violent and can get very intense. So please do read those content warnings and, and, and prioritize your own safety here. All right. And without further ado, let's begin. Once upon a time, the gods loved us. They descended from the river in the sky and taught us how to worship. They taught us how to speak and build homes and cook food and drink wine. They taught us what to do and what not to do, how to think and how not to think. They taught us to pray, to obey, to worship, to devote. And finally, after we had proven our faith, the gods taught us magic. Once upon a time, the gods loved us. And then the river dried up, and the gods were stuck here, and their magic was running out. The star was the first of the 22 major gods to die. He was slain by the watchful eye of his brother, the world, which we now call the witness. His head was mounted in the sky for all to gaze upon and tremble beneath. The other gods, the twenty major and fifty-six minor, gazed as well and learned. They learned that killing brought power and magic and survival and pleasure. Soon, another god was slain, then another, and another. The corpses of fallen deities now litter our endless city, serving as monuments to the viciousness of divinity, the utter cruelty of desperation. Where the slain bodies of gods reside, so too do the dead zones. Pockets of irradiated divinity swarming with curses, monsters, wicked magic. The devouring, as we now call it, is an age of blood and fear, and it persists to this very day. So drink my tears, God Killer, and wet your cheeks with my blood. I have been awaiting your arrival for 10,000 lifetimes. What's one more? The cradle will know your deeds, your sins, your trophies, your epithets. Your arteries will run gold with the name of every god you'll kill. You will die 
and your body will be interred in the parched banks of the dried up river and your enemies will weep and I will weep and you will finally rest. The Cradle The name of the realm our tragedy now unfolds within is an endless city. Skyscrapers rake the horizon from end to end. There are gothic cathedrals, temples of wood and stone, trash-packed alleyways, emerald parks hemmed in by gray boulevards, greenhouses, train stations, power plants, landfills, arboretums, hospitals, prisons, schools. All manner of masonry, of structures, of systemic architectural monuments to powers mundane and divine. A long time ago, the train lines ran, the schools were packed, the churches were filled, the streets hummed with cars and wealth and weapons. Now, the cradle is a ghost of its former self, a post-apocalyptic wasteland marked by shattered glass, centuries-old pile-ups of cars on clogged highways and irradiated monsters that menace the dead zones, pocketing the six districts. These districts are, of course, in, a, in order of ascending importance to our story, the District of Cups, ruled by the dogmatic and bullish Hierophant, who controls worship and devotion. The District of Coins, ruled by the mercurial and whimsical Wheel of Fortune, who controls trade and industry. The District of Wands, ruled by the passionate and lustful magician who controls invention and artistry. The District of Swords, ruled by the merciful emperor and his merciless empress who control violence and authority. The District of the Below, ruled by the impartial and unyielding judgment, whom we call judge, who controls punishment and justice. And finally, the district of the above, ruled by the loving and paranoid world, whom we call witness, who controls knowledge and history. These gods are each served by a mortal speaker and a mortal champion. The speaker interprets and carries out their god's will while the champion serves the speaker with strength and might at all costs. Four of these districts, cups, coins, wands, and swords, fan out from the center of the cradle like wedges on a clock. The below is, well, below everything. And the above is above. Together, these six districts and the seven gods that rule them control the citadel, the powerful center of the cradle, as well as the many hundreds of miles of land fanning out from it. The vast majority of sapient civilization resides within the control of the six, but even gods have their limits. The edges of the Six's domain are known as the Fringe, and the Fringe is full of dead zones, monsters, cannibals, gods that eat each other for survival, power, or simply the sheer pleasure of it. The domain of the Six is not so lawless. Here, major and minor gods alike are forbidden from violating the law of abstention an uneasy concordat that ensures gods cannot kill each other. Deities found guilty of violating the law of abstention are put before the judge and summarily executed. The balance of power between the six is supposedly equal, but always tenuous. For now, however, the balance holds. But no matter where you live in the cradle, no matter who you are, one truth remains constant. If you are a mortal, then you are born, you live, and you die under the yoke of divinity. For only a god can kill another god. Iron 42 
is a dirt-poor mining town on the forgotten outskirts of the Swords District. The settlement is three miles wide and over a dozen miles deep. From above, Iron 42 resembles an open pit mine, but instead of sandstone walls or tiered steps of granite and rock, the walls of Iron 42 are made of buildings. Skyscrapers with cracked skin exposing metal tendons and flesh beaten into the earth like fence posts. Cathedrals with obliterated walls and ceilings smashed against each other like a stained glass assistily. Houses, missing doors, missing windows, missing floors. Ancient folk tales claim that before the devouring, the surface of Iron 42 was once a bustling downtown district. Now, it's a dead hole in the ground. And that hole goes down. Down past the crooked pylons and sparking wires, the slabs of cracked concrete, the glistening veins of plastic. We descend through these layers of sediment of stone and wood and filth until the ground bottoms out to reveal the subterranean heart of Iron 42, the town's true form. A vast, underground settlement carved from the corpses of demolished buildings built around a hole. We see oily structures of rebar and iron, houses of wood, stone, hide, nets with frayed edges dangling off balconies to catch the drunkards who might fall into the hole after one too many. A hole gapped by wooden bridges, swinging rope, ladders, nets, but a hole nonetheless. And at the bottom of that hole, so far down that the light of the gas lamps can't even reach it, is the god of Iron 42. Athamos, the Ten of Wands, the unsighing toil, vassal to the Emperor and Empress. It is within this sea of rebar and ashen divinity that our tale now begins. The year is 1024 AD, a thousand and twenty-four years after the start of the devouring. The day is Tuesday. It is three o'clock in the afternoon, but you wouldn't be able to tell down here anyway. The light from the dead star that hangs in the sky doesn't reach Iron 42. None of these details necessarily matter. What does matter is that today is the day Rune kills the devil. Rune, how does your fateful day in Iron 42 begin? Eat my dust, you fucking shitheads! Uh, and Rune jumps. With a stolen pack of cigarettes being tucked underneath the breastplate of their vest, the shoddy-looking undershirt stained already with dirt, coal, mine dust, Rune free falls down, down, maybe 10, 15 feet before they reach out and grab onto an iron, just a piece of iron sticking out of one of these huge dilapidated sized skyscrapers as they pull themselves up and swing themselves onto a little tiny piece of a wooden bridge as they start to make their way down down, down, deeper into Iron 42. And maybe there are some calls from behind them as the caravan of, you know, sword supply wagon coming through, obviously not stopping in Iron 42 because who the fuck would stop and give actually good goods to Iron 42? But you know what? Rune needed a pack of smokes and here we are. And they are swinging down, running, generally causing mayhem as they are wont to do as an 18-year-old heretic. Yeah, I think behind you we hear a lot of like clanging and banging and hey, wait, stop, that's not yours. Uh, as like a, a couple of brave swords detach themselves from this caravan and try to chase you down this open pit mine that is broken buildings that is Iron 42. And we see that swords, well, swords, of course, they are the mortal enforcers of divine will in the cradle who all answer directly to the citadel. And kind of like rats and kind of like plague, they're found everywhere in the six districts. And they work a wide variety of jobs. And the swords all wear a kind of dull, well-oiled half-plate armor over padded cloth with leather helms that fasten with a rope under the jaw. And true to their title, swords are also equipped with a short 
short sword and a buckler. Uh, but right now, this metal armor, the shield, the boots, the cloth, it is definitely way too clunky for Iron 42. And they keep tripping over themselves. Like you see one of them like like stumble over like the edge of a, of a ledge and like bam, 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 tumble, 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 and like hit his head like against like a piece of rebar that just sticks out from the side. Ugh! <laughs> Careful, oh. buddy. If you fall all the way down, you'll hit Athamus's mouth, dumbass. That's bl blasphemy. Uh, but they, they just kind of curse your name as they're unable to be dexterous enough to follow you down. Down past the surface level of Iron 42, down to sub level. One, two, three, four. You're just swinging and running and like free run your way down there, right? So as you kind of leave these swords in the dust, like literally coughing in your wake, we kind of like swivel around and see you from the front as you're in full motion. What do you look like, Rune? Rune is young. They're they're kind of young, but as many people in Iron 42 tend to be, there are already like lines of soot kind of caked into the corners of their face. They have a very sharp jawline, a strong nose, this kind of wavy dark brown hair that is now like kind of floating around their face as they're falling down, down, down. These like dark storm gray eyes that kind of reflect the iron and the steel and the rock and the stone and the detriment that's all around them. They're well muscled, you know, they work in the mines nine months out of 12, just like everybody else does down here. And their hands are uh, warm and kind of like thickly padded with, um, what is the word? Calluses? Calluses. <laughs> calluses. We, we rub their our brain cells together to produce the we, word callus. We can do it. We can find the word callus. Uh, their hands are well calloused from already at least four years working in the mines at 18. But they are focused. This, again, like kind of intensity as this broken smile like cracks across their face um, as they look behind them. No, there is no fucking way in hell that those bastards are going to catch up with them uh and they don't slow their pace as they go down past seven there's eight they carefully run along the edge of a like tent flap overlooking a bakery that's just kind of i think like hanging out over this open pit as they're like going down 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 this like circular circular path all the way down deeper and deeper into iron 42 and they start to say hello to people as they are passing you know like a little oops sorry Ma molly like as they're like running past and almost step over a fresh loaf of bread things like that <laughs> yeah i love that uh molly who you of course know as ellery's wife uh past like up past the tent flap of the bakery, uh, this kind of like stout woman, she's like literally putting bread out to rest as you come down and like just miss it by like a half step. What, you, uh, uh, Rune, watch your step. You know, yeast is rare. I'm so worried. Lots of girls got yeast. Bye. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, Molly looks stricken, like you just slapped her as you go down, but then, like, as, like, you you descend past her, she, like, ugh, like, rolls her eyes and smiles a little bit and, and tuts, right, and then, like, pulls the bread in slightly, <laughs> just in case there are other heretics trying to tumble their way down. Uh, and as you make your way past, like, sub-level 6, sub-level 7, sub-level 8, we kind of see Iron 42 just, like, this big vista open up around you and viewers and listeners if you may it's kind of like Zon from like Arcane meets like an underground settlement from like Lord of the Rings right it's like a vast just underground city town filled with swinging rope and uh, uh wooden bridges and all of these little like apartments and hovels and little shelters and shacks peeking out from like the rock walls all around you as well as the broken buildings that iron 42 was built into and around and eventually rune i think under the uh, flickering light of the gas lamps that hang every couple meters from like a wooden posts you finally land on sub level 12 which is the final sublevel before the mine shafts begin. It's kind of like the, the last bit of residential and uh, commercial area in Iron 42. So how do you, yeah, how do you make your entrance? Rune's feet like hit that piece of like hard packed concrete earth. Their knees buckle a little bit and they immediately fall into stride next to Zhang, who's there waiting for them. 
uh, they like, they're pretty much still moving and they like glance up, they check their wrist and they go looking at this like kind of cracked, broken watch that doesn't even seem to be running at all. It seems to be completely still and they go seven and a half minutes from the top. And Xiang turns to look at you as you land like a light sheen of athletic sweat over your body and says, that's got to be a new record for you. Yeah, but Aaliyah's still at like 5.20. I don't even know how this, how the hell am I supposed to get two minutes off of my best time? Fuck. <laughs> well, I wouldn't compare yourself against Aaliyah. She's the best free runner among us. And as we turn to look at this person, Tiang, we see a tall, broad, dependable person. Their shoulders are wide and muscular, and they wear this practical leather armor with cloth padding at the joints for maneuverability. And their skin is this light brown, it's tough and calloused from many years of hard labor, even though they're not from Iron 42, uh, and their eyes are the color of coal. And so is Xiang's hair, which they kind of like part around their face in the front and keep in a top knot in the back, uh, and a kind of like messy mullet that goes down regardless. And slung across Xiang's back is the biggest axe you've ever seen. It looks like a lump of barely refined steel, kind of like hammered viciously uh, onto a hardy wooden handle. It's ugly as hell, it's sharp, and it gets the job done. Well, at least you're not the most late person to show up right now, which is honestly a surprise for me. But I've, it's like my the third mission, okay? I'm I'm not late, really, to most things. I'm on time. See, oh, I'm here. Sub level 12, just like you asked me to be, and I wasn't followed. And I got a pack of cigarettes. You're welcome. <laughs> and Yang holds out a hand for, like, for a cigarette uh, as you sort of, like, wave it in the air. And next to them, Reksha lets out a bit of a tisk. We really shouldn't be encouraging such wanton behavior, Xiang. And Reksha is shorter than Xiang by two heads, but she is equally imposing. She is a five foot six bulldozer of a woman uh, with this kind of short, coarse, thick gray hair cropped bluntly at the chin. And her eyes are the same color of gray as her hair, very sharp and piercing, like lightning forking through storm clouds. And the skin of her mouth is wrinkled from laughing a lot. And the skin of her forehead is also wrinkled from frowning a lot. And Reksha is not visibly armed, unlike Tiang, but you, Ru, know that her leather gauntlets, which look slightly larger and more padded than regular leather gauntlets, hide her claws, which are kind of steel assassin's blades that can sort of pop out at a moment's notice. Well, I suppose with you and the 20-odd other heretics gone, Iron 42 is going to be a heck of a lot quieter. I knew that, and I had to make sure that you weren't bored all day, Rekcha. Besides, it's not like they're actually stopping to give us supplies, and we need supplies. I tried to grab a chicken, but um, it pecked me. A chick, a live, a, a live chicken. They had a live chicken on 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 the travel convoy. Huh? Uh, I swear. Cousin. That's rare. Well, you should have grabbed it. I tried. I told you, but it, it attacked me. It attacked my hand. So you can spar all day with Tiang and Freya and Clarion, but you can't grab a single chicken from a loosely guarded sword caravan. I wouldn't say loosely guarded. There were like seven of them and it made a lot of noise. It's the reason I had to run in the first place. Yeah, that's right, Reksha. I mean, come on, we can't expect everyone to be able to pull off something that, well, Aaliyah might be able to. <laughs> hey, kidding, hold on. Dude. I'm just kidding. I'd like to see Aaliyah steal as many smokes as I have. You'd like to see Aaliyah steal one now? And kind uh -huh. of landing, poof, uh, like almost silently behind you is, of course, Aaliyah. Uh, she's a couple years older than you, maybe five or six. Uh, she's got uh, this dark brown skin and these braids that are sort of like tied up into a ponytail that cascades down her back in this like uh, river, this waterfall of braids. And she's smiling and she is tossing in one hand an apple, a freaking apple. She's tossing it up and down and you see there's already a bite out of it. Fresh fruit? Really? You really had to out outdo me like that? Fresh fruit. 
Well, let's just say while swords guarding the caravan may or may not have been distracted by a bunch of clucking and a bunch of cigarettes, I could have stolen two of these. And you see the red apple and the green apple. Oh, seriously? Oh, come on. I I'll, I'll, I'll do... <laughs> Listen, I'll, I'll do gravel duty for two weeks for you the next time we're on shift together. Really? Two weeks? Two weeks, hmm. two weeks of gravel duty. How about one week of gravel duty per bite? That's, that's... It's fair. Or maybe you could have zero weeks of gravel duty and no, no, zero no, 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 bites. No, 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 That's not what I said. That's not what I said. I, I'm, listen, I'm generous, right? You know me. We're, we're friends at this point, right? We look out for each other. One day of gravel duty for each bite. Knock yourself out. And Aaliyah tosses oh, you the green yeah. apple. <laughs> Rin catches it out of the air and kind of marvels at it for a moment. Look, it's even got a stem on it. Fuck. That's nice. I'll write you a poem if you eat the stem. And kind of like just coming out of the shadows like to your right. Like she was kind of there the whole time, but she's really good at blending into the shadows is Opal. And she's only a few years older than you. She's like the youngest of this group of heretics after you. Uh, so you're 18, she's like 21, 22. She comes out, she's kind of this like starved wraith of a girl, right? Like very pale uh, with this like uh, brown hair parted around her face and these two like uh, two wisps. And she like looks at you kind of intensely. Uh, but even though she's a little weird, uh, you know, She's a she's a poet and like she she seems to like you, which is unusual because she doesn't seem to like anyone else really in the heretics. She's kind of standoffish. Rune slings an arm over her shoulder oh. and immediately just kind of bites the apple from the top to include the stem. Because I don't really know how often <laughs> they've eaten an apple. Apples, generally speaking, <laughs> so they just kind of go for it on the top. Would you like to do as you're told? <laughs> Which is a morbid move. Gonna use, this is how we're going to use your first move. <laughs> but yeah, yes. why not? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to tab over to moves here. Do as you're told is a mortal move. And when you do as you're told, say how you show submission and answer one. Uh, I mean, Rune knows that this is more of like, it's, it's more of a dare kind of situation, but they're not one to ever turn down. Pretty much any situation, good or bad. So in that way, it's kind of a like, hey, Rune, why don't you do this this thing that's probably not something you should do? And Rune just goes, yeah, okay, hold hold my hat. I'll do it now. So that is, that's, and I will answer, ooh. Hmm. It's either how are you rewarded or what vulnerability do you reveal as you bite into the stem of the apple? The vulnerability that I'm going to reveal is as uh, Rune bites into the stem, their eyes kind of like flick up. And in this very youthful way, like they're very much like gauging every single person's face as the 21 are like starting to, to come and like finally join the circle of all the heretics going on this mission. Their eyes like flick up to each face to, to find like the affirmation, to find like who's smiling, who's like trying to hide like their face behind their hands they're, they're looking for affirmation they're looking for for love of a of a found family that they have mm. so the move says the gm will show you a glimpse of their true intentions and then answer the other unanswered question so as you look around at these like uh 21 other heretics that are here well 22 if we also count uh uh reksha uh and you see like all of your friends sort of like land right from various shoots, various ladders, various ropes shimming down, like emerging from the shadows until there's like a, a over like a dozen heretics here. And as you look around for affirmation, for praise, for like approval, you, you find it. You find it in Opal who kind of smiles as you bite into the stem. You find it in Aaliyah who kind of laughs and sort of like pats you on the back as you like gulp down the stem and choke on it a bit. Uh, you find it in Reina, who's the other like youngest person here. Uh, she's Vistar's granddaughter here, of course so we see this like older man he's like 70 something but still a heretic still swinging and his granddaughter reina stepping out uh, as they step out of the shadows they're in like an age-old argument that they're always in right vistar's going oh, it's too dangerous 
Raina, hell, even I was 20 when I joined the heretics. Yeah, Grandpa, I know, but I want to make a difference. And look, Rune's eating an apple wrong. Uh, <laughs> turning around and looking at you, right? Like we see the affirmation coming from Bronwyn, who is easily the biggest person here. Like over, like almost seven feet tall, like huge, massive, even more muscled than Xiang, but very gentle, you know? And we see these two cats on Bronwyn's shoulders. Like one is this kind of like big... Mm, a not very bright looking orange cat and the other one's a kind of like slender like black and white tuxedo cat who's like looking a bit disdainfully around at everyone and Bron was going beetle you have to be nice to bug while i'm gone okay and, and bug be nice to beetle and and well don't say that about rune I bet they've never seen an apple before. Come on, they're young. Give them a break. Uh, as the two cats seem to be like <laughs> looking at you judgmentally as well. Hey, hey, Bronwyn, can cats oh. eat apples? Um, yes. Yes, okay. they can. You want some? Uh, Come on, Beetle. Bugsy. Come Beetle. on, Beetle. Beetle eagerly, like this orange tomcat, bats a little paw forward and like tries to go for it. But then Bug, this like uh, black tuxedo cat, like holds out a paw and you see Bug like push Beetle's paw down. Oh, maybe they can't eat apples. Ah, more for me then. They can't even do gravel duty. Oh, no, that's a bug. <laughs> that's a bug. The tuxedo cat seems to, seems to understand what you said there. Yeah, uh, but yeah, you get this sense of camaraderie and family and, and, and friendship here, right? You, you get what you're looking for. And that's their true intention as well. And I'll also answer how you're rewarded. Uh, Opal pipes up behind you. Big teeth chomping down. Head of the apple consumed. I'm glad Rune didn't... Oh, no, that's six syllables. Glad Rune didn't choke. There's a poem for you. Thanks, Opal. You always write such uh, visceral. <laughs> it's always really visceral. Oh, thanks. Well, you know what they say about art. What do they say? Art is pain. Oh. Most things in the cradle are pain. Have you ever considered that maybe art should be something other than pain? Hmm. And Opal cocks her head, like her wisps like fall to the side as she looks at you. Like she's never really considered that before. Well, I only ever really write what I know. But maybe after tonight... Maybe there will be better than just pain in the cradle. <laughs> and and Rune almost like laughs a little bit <laughs> giddy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it's risky. And they look kind of sideways at Xiang for that approval again, like that level headed approval. But it's happening. It's really happening. And as that like sense of giddiness like rises up inside you, as if on cue, Xiang sort of claps his uh, hands together. All right, everyone, heretics, we all know what we are here to do tonight. If this goes as planned, everything's going to change for the better. Not just for us, not just for Iron 42, but maybe, maybe eventually for the cradle too. Well, uh, Reksha, Reksha will be taking my place as leader of this particular cell in Iron 42 while we are gone for expedition, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't be gone too long, Reksha. Uh, any words, Reksha, before we leave? And Reksha, this like five foot six, like gray haired woman, like <clears throat> steps up, <clears throat> clears her throat. Speech! Uh, yes. Thank you, Rune. And there's like a, a giggle <laughs> from people. As Rector sort of like shoots you down a bit. I'm going to say the thing I always say whenever any of us go out on mission. Don't be stupid and don't die. Rexha, everybody! Your second Ooh. in command. Oh yeah! And of course, because Rexha's staying behind to mind business in 942 while we're gone, uh, Freya will be my second in command here for this particular mission. So if I am, God forbid, 
ungods forbid, incapacitated for any reason, uh, defer to Freya. And Freya steps forward. She is this well-muscled woman with like a, a gnarly scar running across her face. It looks like a grizzly bear attacked her and she won. Uh, and we, you know her, uh, Rune, as being a former like fighting pit champion from, from a different town who came here on heretic business. And she has like a, her head is shaved on the sides and like a shock of red hair that's like dyed crimson uh, is like hanging in front of her eyes, which are electric blue. She sort of crosses her scarred arms over a muscular chest and nods imposingly. All right, then. Let's uh, commit some heresy that'll make King Morius III, Speaker of Swords, eyes roll back in his head, yeah? <laughs> oh, do, you, do you think that they'll hear about it all the way in the Citadel? Do you think they'll know? Do you think people will come? I'm confident people will come. And I'm confident people will hear of it. And I'm confident that this is the eve of a massive change. We've been working toward something like this our entire lives. It has to work. It's going to work. All right, on your feet. And with that, uh, Xiang, uh, and you and like the 20 other heretics uh, all start funneling toward this kind of like a uh, blocked off entrance into the mines. Uh, and as you do, like Rexha is sort of like patting each of you on the back as you go, like, be careful. Yes, yes, mind the explosions. Don't be stupid. Don't die. And is patting each of you on the back as you're like going past. Uh, do you say anything to Rexha as you as you go into the mines? You know, you talked all of that, but. And Rune reaches into, like, their breast pocket and pulls one of the cigarettes out of the box. All right. And Rexha just sort of snatches it and sort of, like, folds it <laughs> in, like, her breast pocket, right, underneath her plate armor. You're welcome. Uh, and even though she looks a little annoyed, there's, there's a crack of, like, softness under that, like, wrinkled face, right? Like, she kind of gives you a stern look, but there's a, a bit of a smile curling at her lips. Aaliyah, watch after that one. Aye, aye, Rexha. Come on, Rune. And Aaliyah slings, a, like, an arm over your shoulders. You ready to go into your first dead zone? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. And, and, yeah, no, I've been training for this for a while now. And dead zones aren't that bad, right? Just hear horror stories about them constantly. There's like nothing bad that can happen in there, right? Oh, I wouldn't say dead zones aren't so bad. And this is Relim, who kind of like starts walking backward in the tunnels with his arms like uh, propped underneath their head, as they do. And they're like expertly just like walking backward. And everyone knows Relim as this kind of like gangly, like lots of piercings, lots of tattoos, very inventive storyteller. Uh, I have a cousin who uh, went into a dead zone a couple years ago, came out half uh, lizard. What? Yeah, half lizard wasn't fully human by the end. We had to put him down. What? Oh, come yeah. on. And that's if I'm you're not lucky a child. To come out. Well, you're, you're you're barely not a child, Rune. You've only got four years of of mind shifts under your belt. Oh, that's plenty. Besides, I've seen some shit. Oh yeah, like what? Real big rats. <laughs> Listen, you don't even get to 18 in Iron 42 without seeing some shit. You know that is just as well as I do. Yeah, yeah, Relim, lay off. I mean, unless you want me to tell Rune about the fourth girl that rejected you from the Iron Fiddle last night. We don't have to get that far. We don't have to, we don't have to get that far. Uh, I guess she just wasn't buying what I was selling. Is anyone Which is buying what you're selling? A crock of bullshit, right? Because all your stories are bullshit. Hey, 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 kids love them. Kids and ladies love them. What can I say? Uh-huh. Not those four ladies last night. Hey! <laughs> and Aaliyah raises a hand for you to high five. Ha <laughs> ha, got him. Yeah, 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 all right. Well, you better watch your back in the dead zone, Rune. Or the ghost of a god might getcha. 
<laughs> Stop. <laughs> hey, Lyron, wait up. Uh, and Velum turns and like catches up with a friend at the front. And Aaliyah, like as you're continuing through this tunnel, kind of looks down at you and Opal looks up at you from the other arm. And Aaliyah, in, in like a moment of, of, of sincerity, goes, you know, you, you never really have seen or gone into a dead zone before, Rune. But you're going to be okay, all right? We're all watching out for you. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we're all, we're a team, right? Yes, and there is no I in team, as they say, but there is an I in kill. There's also an I in witness, but he can't see into the dead zones, can he? Nope, none of them can. <laughs> Not even the most powerful of them. Oh, well, we'll be fine. That's right. We will be fine. After all, if the devil makes good on his promise, there shouldn't be anything in the dead zone to menace us. And at that, Rune gets a little quiet. Their face, like, closes up a little bit. And they look uh, up to where Zhang is walking at the front, I think. They kind of stare at his back for a moment, trying to find that sense of stability. Are we really sure that the devil can be tr trusted for something like this? <laughs> of course not, kid. The only good god's a dead one. Can't trust any of them that can talk. Well, you know what they say about the devil? He's a god of his word. He, his whole thing is deals and contracts, right? All these gods, they all, they all have some sort of, I don't know, like inner law that guides them, makes them click, right? I mean, Athamas down there clicks off of, you know, our life force, and the witness clicks off of what well, gods knows what. Xiang says the devil clicks off deals, so we made a deal. It's going to be honored. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we can. We can do it. And Opal actually reaches up and squeezes your hand. Right, like reassuringly. And her hand is so clammy. <laughs> it is so clammy and cold and kind of wet. Uh, but she, she squeezes you with this kind of like solid reassurance. It's going to be okay, Rune. Everything's going to change, like you said. For the better. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope the cradle knows what's coming. And you continue to walk. Uh, Rune, you are very familiar with the mines, right? Like, you know all of these tunnels like the back of your hand. So you know that you've never been down this one. And you're pretty sure you've never worked any adjacent shafts here either. After all, Iron 42 rarely, if ever, closes down tunnels wholesale. Usually only like a section is blocked off for demolition or to clear out like a toxic buildup of gases or something like that. Uh, and there are only really two reasons why Iron 42 might block off an entire tunnel. One is that it's so structurally unsound that any kind of excavation runs the risk of collapsing an entire sector. And another is that it eventually leads to a dead zone. And it is, of course, forbidden to venture into a dead zone. Uh, you've been told your entire life that dead zones are extremely dangerous. They're teeming with hungry, vicious ghosts of mortals and gods who met violent ends. And just like Relum said, you know, even though like that story about his cousin was probably half bullshit, there is a nugget of truth there, right? Dead zones are overrun by monsters, by irradiated magic. And it is said that people who venture into dead zones come back monsterized if they come back at all. And crucially, dead zones also nullify divine magic. So all gods, minor and major, are significantly weakened while they're in or even near a dead zone. And it is with this knowledge in mind, with this maybe hope brimming within you, that you, Jiang, Opal, Aaliyah, and your family of heretics heads deep into the earth. The smell of powder, of oil, of grease, and eventually just cave swirls in your nostrils. Your footsteps 
echo off the narrow walls in a constellation of compressed sound from all these dozen heretics. You can hear your friends talking to each other all around you in these low murmuring voices, and occasionally like a laugh bubbles up or like a grouchy sentiment. But all in all, actually, your companions you're noticing are fairly somber. There is a sense of urgency and trepidation kind of hanging in the air that's as thick and heavy as the molten slag of Iron 42's furnaces. And as the shadows kind of dance along the walls, illuminated by your group's various lamps and torches, there's this overwhelming sense of anxious excitement ascending through the heretics, right? From Aaliyah, whose like arm is still slung around your shoulders, but she's like tapping your shoulder kind of nervously. From Opal, who's now squeezing your palm as you get closer and closer to the dead zone. Even from like Realm's nervous laughter, like bouncing off the walls ahead of you, right? And Xiang's like solid, stable anchor of a voice. That seems to be like the main thing containing all this anxious excitement. There is a shared feeling among all of you that everything is going to change very soon. What's that last image we see of you, Rune, before we reach the dead zone? I think Rune hangs back for a moment. This is only their third mission, but it's so exciting. They cannot possibly believe that everything in their small, insignificant life has led them here to change the cradle, to fight for a different world. To go so far as to make a deal with the devil, yes. But to change everything. So that maybe they could dream of different things. They, they won't dream of holes anymore. They won't dream of sticks of dynamite, of rocks, of sorting rocks. They won't have that dream where they're standing on the street corner watching ghosts go by, that maybe there's a different world, a different world. And they hang back kind of in the shadow of this tunnel, letting it surround them for a moment, press in to their skin or where their eyes flutter open and they jog after Aaliyah and catch up with their friends. Wait up, don't leave me behind. We well, better catch up, Slowpoke. Come on. Okay. This is it, right? Yes. This is it. Are you ready? I'm gonna go walk next to Xiang. All right, then. <laughs> Teacher's favorite. Shut up. Hey, hey, hey. I made do with my jealousy years ago. All right? Now go. Talk to Xiao. Okay. And Rune kind of like weaves their way through the bodies up to the front. Xiang is currently talking kind of in hushed tones with Freya at the very front. They're maybe like uh, 10 feet ahead of everyone else. Uh, and you, you squeeze past Bronwyn, who's like, who takes up the entire width of the tunnel. And Bronwyn of, uh, had left Bug and Beetle behind uh, with Rexha, of course, because this is definitely not safe. Uh, Bronwyn just goes, oh, oh excuse me. Uh, that he squeeze under under arm. Oh, sorry about that. Coming through. And uh, I think a couple of kitty treats like litter down on you just ambiently <laughs> as you squeeze past them. Tink, tink, tink. Rune eats one. <laughs> uh, it's dry and full of protein. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, you you finally reached Xiang and Freya. Uh, they're kind of talking, talking, and like as they notice you approach, like they, they kind of they both kind of stop talking and uh, they slow down so you can catch up. Rune. Hey. Hey. Just, I mean, I just wanted to, I wanted to see the dead zone as soon as we got there. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Of course he did. And there's nothing to fear. The devil will uphold his end of the bargain. There shouldn't be anything there waiting for us. But if there is? That's why we come armed. Yeah, okay. And Rune kind of like finally rests their hand at their hip uh, where there are two short um, 
blades kind of like sticking out of their waistband. Um, they're about like the length of Rune's forearm uh, with a long hilt that doesn't have a guard or anything. It's just hilt that immediately turns into blade. And at the end of these two swords are a pretty simple chain linked chain, really, holding each end together. Uh, and that chain is kind of looped around Rune's waist a few times um, and kind of hangs down and tinkles a little as they walk. And Rune rests their hand on top of this sword and like feels the groove along their thumb. We're nodding. Yeah, we can fight ghosts, right? <laughs> well, I guess we're going to find out tonight. And Rune and Xiang, like, uh, exchanges a glance with Freya. There's like a, a unspoken understanding between the two of them, and Freya kind of slows down to like give the two of you some privacy as you continue walking forward. You know why everyone calls us heretics. I don't have to give you the old lesson, but um, you know what? Screw it. I will. One last time. They call us heretic Ugh. because we are blasphemers. We do not believe in the absolute power of gods and divinity. We believe that it is mortals' right, privilege, and destiny to shape our own fate. And as things in the cradle go, we can't do that. We can't have that. We must tithe to Athamos every season, giving him a little bit of what few years we have left on our own lifespan. The witness sees all. We cannot act in freedom. The below cages anyone that speaks out against this inequity. So they call us heretic. They call us sacrilege. They call us witch. They call us blasphemer. And we say yes. Why yes, we are all those things because heretic is not such a bad thing to be. I asked you this question when you first came to me, wanting to join us. And I ask you again now on the eve of your third mission, Rune. Why do you want to be a heretic? Because I want to choose when I die. I don't want to tithe and tithe and tithe my life away to Athamos until he decides when my life is up. I want to decide. I want to go down swinging. Good answer. All right, kid, welcome to your first dead zone. And the two of you pause at the mouth of a tunnel. Now uh, you've reached the end of the series of mines and it opens up into a vast underground cathedral. Yes, cathedral. Marble pillars extend 60 feet up into the air, holding up a vaulted ceiling with once colorful, now faded fresco paintings of, what are those? Angels? Yes, angels. Humanoid shapes with wings and eyes, spinning wheels of gears and flame, rows and rows of teeth and tongue and horn and bone. Windows lime this cathedral, stained glass apertures that look blankly out into nothing. Just black expanses of dirt, earth, soil. A balcony level, about 20 feet up, overlooks the main hall of this cathedral where a single red tongue of carpet extends from the massive double oak doors all the way up to the altar. And the altar is a sight to behold, a slab of gelid stone, pure white in its majesty, the length of three people easily and the width of two, laden with candlesticks of pure gold, but no candles, incense holders, but no incense, ancient rotting black Things that used to be offerings, perhaps, food or scraps of meat that have long since fossilized. There are also gems. Rubies, diamonds, 
sapphires, fat, luscious coins of gold and silver and bronze. And facing the altar, in perfectly arranged rows, are the pews. Wooden pews, moldy and rotting, but somehow still standing. And at the mouth of this tunnel, uh, which is only maybe like four people across, uh, you and the heretics take in this dead zone with careful eyes. The tunnel has been bored into the western side of the cathedral, uh, halfway between the wooden doors and the altar with a column of pews in front of you. It sort of intersects like uh, at a perpendicular angle into the cathedral. Rune, as you take this dead zone in, what do you do? Rune stops breathing and doesn't remember until the pressure in their chest peaks and claws kind of open at their throat and they inhale sharply, breathing in as they take this resplendent cathedral underground. There are no ghosts, there are no monsters. They don't feel a sickening turn in the back of their mind like everyone had always warned them. They don't feel the oppressive force of divinity pinning them and ripping their bones out one by one by one. They just feel small, but at the same time so large that if they kicked even a pebble, they feel like they'd be able to hear it from miles away. And wide-eyed, they turn their gaze over to Xiang. What? How did this place get down here? <gasps> One of the many mysteries of the cradle. Huh. There's gems. Don't touch those. No one touch the gems. Uh, Freya, Bronrun, Emrys to the south. Everyone else, let's secure the perimeter, all right? Don't touch anything. Weapons drawn. Be on the ready. Don't trust anything you see here. And Rune shifts. Like, from this kind of, like, 18-year-old, a little spunky, a little arrogant, a little, you know, they're 18. They're very gay. They're trying, they're, they're seeking parental approval. Uh, they shift a little bit to something more focused. Someone who has had to fight to live for a long time. And they draw both of their blades, this kind of shiny black iron, the, the, the pinnacle of what iron 42 produces, the finest kind of steel that can come from this place, born of the stone the same way that Rune is. And it like shines in this kind of low light for half a moment as the chain begins to drag on the ground behind them as Rune moves forward to help secure the perimeter. Sort of still marveling at everything, but in the way that they're looking for the shadows that creep and crawl and well, looking for anything that they shouldn't see. Mm. Yeah, as you step in, there's kind of like maybe like a five foot drop from where the tunnel dumps in. Because it's like literally bored into the side of the cathedral. You get a sense that whatever poor Iron 42 miners, like they opened up this dead zone and they went, nope, and like backed up. <laughs> like they were like, nope, no thank you. And they backed up, right? Uh, so you and all the other heretics drop maybe like five feet, six feet, like onto the uh, pure marble floor of this cathedral. And you like start to like trickle out like a, a convoy of ants, like entering like a huge hall. And you like look around you. This place is massive. This is the main hall of like a huge cathedral. Even by cathedral standards, it's very large. Like this can easily seat a flock of like over 200 people here, right? Like the altar is big. The, the vaulted ceilings extend up like the arms of giants trying to steeple their fingers up at the apex together to, to meet. And as you walk, uh, you notice that, well, what's interesting is the, yes, can I use a move here? Uh, a mortal uh, yeah. move? Yes, you can. Go ahead. I would like to feel something or some uh, feel someone or something out. When I try to feel out a person, place, or thing, say what I want clarity about and answer one. Go for it. Yes, I'm gonna scroll down to that. Feel something or someone out. Uh, that's basically our insight check, <laughs> our vibe check, our vibe check move. Go for it. Uh, so, what do you want clarity about? I want clarity about 
how this dead zone is currently existing, I suppose. Like where, what is the thing that makes this a dead zone and not just a really weird thing that exists in the mine tunnels? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll, why don't you answer one first and then I'll answer you and then answer the other question as well. Okay. I'll take what feels welcoming on the surface. I think it is so quiet and so clean in here. Like everything in Iron 42 is covered with a thick layer of soot. Like everything, people, places, food, blankets, everything is covered in a little bit of soot and dust, a little bit of wear, a little bit of apocalypse that hangs on everything and everyone. And this is the cleanest place that Rune has ever been or ever seen. And the fact that it has been untouched, question mark, since it was discovered and closed off is, well, that seems at least a little bit magical. And there's something inviting about a place like this, a place that is so new that it feels like it was just birthed out of the earth itself. And I feel like that's what feels welcoming on the surface to Rune. I will now give you the clarity you seek. You asked me what makes this place a dead zone. And the answer is, a god died here. This isn't just some random cathedral in the middle of the earth as you do. This is the graveyard of a deity. And typically, dead zones are also populated, at least according to folklore, according to legends and stories you've been told ever since you were a kid, right, to school you into behaving, that dead zones contain bodies. Bodies of the gods that died there like actual physical corpses, right? Rotting with irradiated divinity. And I'll now answer the other question left untouched, which is what feels unnerving when I peer deeper. There's no body here. There's no miasma of rotten magic. There are no gibbering beasts. There is no ravenous maw of a monster ready to snap up these feckless heretics. It is completely empty hey Xiang hey. isn't there supposed to be something here Xiang's axe is drawn it's not lifted but it is drawn and they're sort of like dragging it on this uh, flagstones kind of behind them holding it up just a little uh, they are halfway up the steps toward the altar. Everyone else is sort of fanned out behind them, like the V in the wake of a shark. And I think you're the only one that's like close to them, like maybe with your uh, your left foot up on the on the very first step, uh, leading up to the altar. Yeah, yeah. The devil promised that they would clear out this dead zone, but preserve the veil that nullifies other divinities' power here, so we could you know, set up roots here. So the optimist in me says the devil did it already. But the realist in me says there's something else afoot. Yeah, you're not much of an optimist. And there's something small in Rune that hates the way that their voice sounds, the tremble that it has. And they realize kind of belatedly that they are scared. Mm. Zhang hears that. There's a pause. Uh, their their left foot is on like the very top step and they turn around to look down at you. Uh, and there's a kind of just like ever-present light in this place, I think, that you're starting to pick up on. There's just light everywhere and they're kind of limbed by it, right? They look down at you, they're silhouetted and you can see their face kind of cast in shadow with a halo of light behind Zhang's head, right? Illuminating that top knot, right? The mullet that spills down past their shoulders and they say... Hey, kid. It's gonna be okay. All right? We're all here. We're all together. A single link breaks. A chain holds. And Rune steals themselves. And they pull taut their sword. And the sound of the metal, like, pulling taut kind of matches the rhythm of their own heartbeat. Right. Right. Hey, and no matter what happens, all of us are always here with you, okay? Uh, 
Yeah, of course you are. Good. Good. Devil. Devil, if you are here, show yourself. We have no time nor patience for games. What is this? Silence. Like, no response. Xiang's voice just echoes off of the huge cathedral walls. And even though Xiang's voice is so resonant, so booming, so commanding, something about the vastness of this place swallows his voice up. And Xiang <clears throat> clears their throat again. Devil, reveal yourself now. Haven't you ever heard the saying, the devil's in the details? There is a sensation like falling, like your heart is plummeting through your chest, your guts, your groin, like the cathedral is opening up into bottomless void beneath you, and then you realize what this feeling is. It's the presence of divinity. Reaching down from the ceiling, peeling himself away from the rest of the fresco paintings of angels, is the devil. He reaches an arm down towards your party, and as he does, the painted feathery wings splayed behind him flay themselves off the plaster in a shower of golden and crimson light. And the devil elegantly dips his legs beneath him and floats onto the ground, his bare toes alighting upon the altar. He is ten feet tall, and he is not made of flesh, but pure magic. Magic the color and texture of fresco tiles, his skin light brown, his hair long and black, and draping past his shoulders. A white robe covers him just barely, revealing a V of toned muscle cinched at the waist by a blood-red sash. Two horns, the color of charcoal, break up and back from his forehead, and four wings splay open behind him. The two wings on top are white and feathery and 15 feet long in either direction, and the two on the bottom are black and made of leather, like bat's wings, and just a little bit smaller, but not by much. And both pairs of wings stretch out for a minute and then fold behind his back. And the devil's face is an aberration of beauty. It is the most perfect thing you've ever laid your gaze upon. His eyes are the thing that strike you. They're crimson, bright crimson, red as blood, red as fire. There is something glowing and immaculate about them, like they're a glimpse into an endless immolation that's burning just beneath the surface of this form he's presenting to you right now. And finally, the devil's shadow is the height of the cathedral wall behind him, 60 feet tall, a dozen feet wide, many times larger than this 10-foot form he's showing you right now. Rune. You've been in the presence of gods before. Specifically, you've been in the presence of Athamos the Unsighing Toil, the god of Iron 42 to whom you must tithe. And if Athamos is kind of like a drop of water, right, then the devil is the ocean. There is no comparing the power between a minor and a major god. The difference between their divinities is unfathomable. If you are a mere ant to Athamos, then Athamos is a speck to the Devil's Mountain. How do you respond? How, what is your immediate reaction to this, Rune? Have you ever seen a rabbit animal? <laughs> uh, no. The first time I saw a rabbit animal... Something in my body stopped me from moving any closer before I had even realized that I had seen it. And I think that self-same 
feeling comes over Rune, where everything about them freezes. Like their blood runs cold all the way. And there is a feeling deep underneath their rib cage. And they know that they are in the presence of a predator, of something that could not even kill them. Death is so small compared to whatever this feels like. And Rune wants to be a speck. They want to be an ant. They do not want to be seen or noticed, but they are so close to him that they cannot help but feel drawn closer. <laughs> like half of their soul shrinks away and the other layers itself over top of their skin pulled toward him. Like gravity is rewriting all of their molecules at the same time as they stare up at this god, not a minor god, like Athamos, the sighing toil. A major god. The devil smiles. He has fangs. Don't you know patience is a virtue? We are on the precipice of a monumental change. We should enjoy the eve of metamorphosis, shouldn't we? Jiang, who in the entire time you've known him has never backed down from a challenge, shrinks. For just a second, just a heartbeat, Jiang, this mountain of a rebel leader, suddenly seems very small and very, very breakable. And then he gathers up his courage. He tightens his grip around the handle of his axe, but he doesn't raise it toward the devil. He does, however, take that final step up onto this raised dais uh, to the very head of the crowd of heretics and faces the devil. He sort of plants himself between you and the devil and the altar. Devil, we have a deal. You are to cleanse this dead zone, but preserve the veil so that we might create a new home unyoked by divinity. And in return, we shall offer you Precious knowledge. Knowledge of Athamos's heart and his downfall, so that you might have your fill of eating. <laughs> Xiao Jiang, ah, a deal's a deal. You don't have to repeat the terms to me. I sign on the dotted line, you sign on the dotted line, that's it. All that's left is to... Do it. But what's the rush? Why not enjoy this time we have left with each other before everything changes? Before you go off to make your little utopia untethered by godhood and I go off to have another tasty snack. Hmm? Devil? We are ready. Are you? Ah, oh, such impudence. I understand the urge now to squash you all like bugs. And for a second, the 60-foot shadow peels away from the ceiling and hovers over all of you like a falling night sky. And then the devil says, just kidding. And the shadow is back on the wall. Very well. Very, very, very well. If you wish to expedite your journey, go ahead and spill your guts about Athamos. Not so fast. The dead zone. Is it cleansed? Is the veil still intact? Well, you tell me. I don't see any hungry ghosts or mean little monsters. I also don't see Athamos skittering up here on all hundreds, screaming about conspiracy. What do you think? 
Did you cleanse the zone? Or did you not? Oh my gods, you were a buzzkill. Yes, I cleansed the zone. I ate every single lost soul before you heretics arrived and even had my fill of the corpse of the poor god that was slain here. Oh, fun name, by the way, your little faction. Heretics. An insult you've reclaimed from the very sheep you now seek to guide. I know your philosophies are popular out here in the nowhere towns, where your gods are cruel and your prospects few, but you must know that heresy is a capital crime in the Citadel. We're not in the Citadel. Hmm. And yet, you tithe to a god that tithes to the six. Tell me, what exactly is your plan after you secure your little slice of heaven below Earth? This zone isn't exactly large enough to hold an entire town, much less a district. You'll have to keep feeding me gods if you want to expand your little mortal utopia. I sense the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Don't you, Executioner? At that, Jiang looks at the devil with an unreadable expression. And it is the same expression that flits across their face whenever their past comes up. And Rune, you've known Jiang for years at this point. You have no idea where they originally came from or what their history is. All you know is they're not from Iron 42 originally. But a lot of heretics aren't. That's not necessarily unusual. But this term, this epithet, executioner, is the first you've ever heard in reference to Jiang. And for a moment, Jiang is silent. They don't say anything. And I think at this point, you have a chance to chime in or do something if you'd like. Jung! Rune, what is it? We believe in you. You're our leader. You guide us. Okay? You've tithed, you've tithed for us already. And Rune flits their gaze to the devil for the first time attempting to look at him directly. Whatever it takes, even a deal with you. <laughs> Oh, it's a funny little bug you have at your side, it's young. The devil doesn't look at Yerun when you talk. This entire time, both of his crimson eyes have been trained on Jiang. When you speak, his eyes don't move from Jiang's face. He, like, isn't even talking to you. You're not even sure if he has acknowledged you or recognizes you in, at any point. The only mortal the devil has been addressing or acknowledging in any way this entire time has been Jiang. You, tithing for them. Oh, yes, I can see it. The cut strings of fate hovering off your shoulders. How many years did you give up to Athamos to save these people here? Hmm? These ash-streaked faces, these little soot balls for lives. He gave up everything. Rune. Thank you. I got this. And Tiang, like, gathers themselves again, right? Like, you speaking up behind them seems to have reinvigorated them. They're no longer speechless. They, like, readjust their grip on their axe, and they, like, square their shoulders and look up at the devil, like, looks him straight in the eyes, which you don't know how he's able to do that, because looking at the devil's eyes is like looking directly into the sun. Those burning pits of crimson, those burning flames. 
And Xiang says, Enough, devil. We're ready. No more dawdling. <laughs> All right, fine, fine, fine. Let's get this over with, if that's what you're all so eager to do. Your end of the bargain, Xiang? Xiang takes a deep breath. Uh, he looks like he's stealing himself before an executioner's axe. They close their eyes, they clench their fists, and when they look back up at the devil again, there is nothing but determination in their face. The heart of Athamos, the Ten of Wands, his true form, is a massive white centipede. The downfall of Athamos, the unsighing toil, his only weakness, is the soft flesh underneath his impenetrable chitin. Oh, that's... Underwhelming? <laughs> Who would have thought that the way to squash a bug is to... Squash it? Ah, well. A deal's a deal. I suppose I'm having insect for dinner. Oh. And one more thing. At that, Jiang frowns, tilts his head to the side. All that stuff about the devil needing to honor deals. Well, it's a myth. And for a split second, Xiang looks scared. And because Xiang looks scared, the other heretics in the cathedral also start to look scared. No, no, no. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, the looks on your faces. Oh. oh, I'm a god of my word. And the devil snaps. And Xiang erupts into flame. The screaming starts instantly, but it doesn't come from Xiang. It comes from the other heretics. Reyna immediately shrieks and runs forward, but Freya grabs her by the arm, holding her back. Opal, who was behind you this whole time, kind of staggers backward, and Bronwyn steps forward, their face alight with the fire that's now burning Xiang's skin, their clothes, their hair, and that's when Xiang begins to scream. It is a scream of pain, it is a scream of anger, and overwhelmingly, it is a scream of fear. And ablaze, Jiang staggers to the side, the smell of burning flesh now starting to fill the room, a uh, black smoke coiling up toward the ceiling. And Jiang is, is shrieking through his own cries of pain. You liar! You fucking liar! This, this was not the deal! This was not what we said! This was not... And Freya is now drawing her weapons, and Griffin is drawing his weapons, and Dalvai is drawing their weapons, and Xiang rushes forward, still on fire, heaving his axe up in a powerful strike you've seen separate heads from bodies, up toward the devil, and the devil snaps, and Xiang crumbles into ash. And all hell breaks loose. And we're going to take a break there. Uh, so we will be back in about 10 minutes. Um, enjoy the waiting room music. Enjoy a word from our sponsors at some point during it. And uh, Shpijo Pijo, see you in 10.
Hello, transplaners and new friends alike. Do you want to play TTRPGs but aren't sure where to start? Maybe you don't have a GM or players or a consistent schedule that everyone can stick to. Whatever your obstacles might be, I've got a solution for you. Start playing games. And by that, I mean the website, startplaying.games. Start Playing is the largest online platform for players to find a playgroup and professional GMs for any game system and any virtual tabletop. Over 20,000 players have found their playgroup through startplaying.games. Game masters set their own price, ranging from free sessions to paid adventures, and their search functionality allows you to sort games by system, length, schedule, and price. You can sign up with a group of friends or meet new ones through startplaying.games. Whether you're brand new to RPGs, a seasoned veteran, or just curious about what's out there, StartPlaying.Games has you covered. Sign up for a free account today by using exclamation point Start Playing in chat. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Hello, 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 everybody. It is so good to see all of your digital non-existent faces in the chat once more. What a first half, am I right? We're just gonna hop right back into it. So C, why don't you remind our lovely audience what the content warnings are for this uh, campaign? I'd be happy to if I could figure out how to turn on my mic. God Killer First Blood is a dark fantasy series that contains content that may be triggering to some viewers. Woo ha! Content warnings for this episode include fantasy violence, gore, body horror, classism, poverty, immolation and fire, death of loved ones, heights, falling, vast and unknowable depths, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, and references to child labor, carceral oppression, and cannibalism. Use exclamation point CW in chat at any time to get a full list of these content warnings. Connie, you are ready for part two? I'm ready for I'm part two. I'm coming for you now, my friends. Oh, you're gunning for me? Are you try? <laughs> you can you try. You fucked up this time. You <laughs> fucked up this time. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see who comes out on top at the end of this. We'll see. We'll see. All right, without further ado, let's begin. The cathedral smells like smoke and death. What remains of Jiang is a crumbled heap of charcoal on the floor before the altar. Their axe, still mid-air from their swing, clatters to the ground with a loud and final clang. Rune, you watch it fall in slow motion. The brutal, brilliant curve of the axe head, the black leather wrapped around the polished handle, the many dings and dents and scratches on the steel that you've become so familiar with from a thousand hours sparring with Tiang. Tiang, who taught you how to fight. Tiang, who taught you how to fear, how to be brave, how to hope. Tiang, your mentor, your father in so many ways you never had, your friend, now just ash. And then Freya says, You motherfucker! And she charges forward. Her twin daggers strike like the fangs of a viper. Freya had taught you this move before, or at least she tried. You'd always been too slow, too in your head to get it right. And now you see it. The perfect arc of violence as she crests through the air, the unerring trajectory of both daggers down toward the devil's clavicle, toward his heart. Does he even have a heart? And then he snaps, and Freya erupts into flame. She smashes into his chest anyway, but her daggers break on contact. They just snap, and she bounces onto the ground as though she'd run headfirst into a concrete pillar, and Freya is shouting in pain, just like Jiang was, and you watch as she rolls, trying to put out this fire, but it doesn't go, and the more she resists, the harder and hotter it burns, and now the the smell of Freya's burning flesh mixes in with the residue from Xiang, and now everyone in this cathedral is screaming, every single heretic, their leader is dead, their second in command is on fire, and chaos rules all. Rune, what do you do? It's so empty. This moment of terror is so empty, because they're living two minutes in the past still they haven't even 
begun to understand what it means to turn someone into ash, to take a life that fast, to end the existence of the person who gave their literal life force years and years and years to protect them is is ash how can that be that can't be it's not it's it's a bad dream it has to be a bad dream and rune is stuck like a stone pillar completely stuck horrified staring at the handle of that axe waiting for Jiang to pick it up waiting for him to come back and he'll he'll pick it up in just a second he just dropped it he's he's going to pick it up he will he's going to pick it up he wouldn't leave me. He wouldn't leave me. And this is the mantra that plays in Rune's head as they stand entirely still. Before your eyes, Freya crumbles into ash, and her twin daggers clatter onto the ground several dozen feet away from Xiang's. And you are not the only heretic here who is frozen in shock. As several heretics are, are screaming and shouting and like t talking at each other, pointing, just like pure panic and chaos setting in, others are frozen. We see Opal behind you, like she's shaking, right? Like those two wisps framing her face, trembling. Uh, we see Uriel, who had lost his arm in a mining accident, now wears a prosthetic. Like they're also standing there just trembling. Uh, we see Phylon, a server at the Iron Fiddle, right? Who, who had served there for 35 some years. We see his beard quivering, his eyes wide, tears brimming against his pupils, but not quite falling in, in abject shock. Then Aaliyah. It is Aaliyah. It is always Aaliyah. Raises her voice. She draws her blade, a rapier, and she raises her throat and she screams hoarse at the top of her lungs. Heretics! We need to fight back! If we don't fight back, their deaths will have been for nothing! Come on now, everyone. And the heretics, your friends, your family, they rally, they heed Aaliyah's call, their jaws set, they draw their weapons, they shake their heads, they raise their voices, they surge forward as a powerful, united front all around you, Aaliyah taking the charge, Nahar roaring with their full voice, Briar's head low as she thrusts forward with a spear, Griffin running forward, Ellery brandishing a whip, uh, flying with his mace, Clarion, Uriel, Emrys, even Braith, the field medic, the pacifist who had taught you everything you knew about bandaging a wound who once told you that words cut deeper than blades even Braith is running forward dagger drawn screaming shouting tears flying from his face even opal now barely older than you so moody so guarded so shy even opal surges past you toward the light of the devil limbed by fire toward the light of the devil's shadow even opal and as the heretics rush forward, weapons drawn, war cries brimming in their throats, the devil throws his head back and he laughs. <laughs> oh. Oh. And on that laugh, one by one, by one, by one, every single heretic lights on fire. And then the screaming comes. And you can't tell any of their screams apart. The cathedral is on fire. You stand in the middle of this immolating heresy. The devil is at the altar. His shadow is behind him. He is laughing and laughing and laughing. And finally... 
he lowers his head, and that's when the last scream stops, and the last body crumbles into ash. Bronwyn's, the biggest, a silhouette of pure black charcoal just crumbling to the ground. And the devil, still chuckling, wipes a tear oh, from the corner of his eye, a blood-red tear, and flicks it off his finger. And where that tear lands, a rose made of crimson glass blooms. Oh! Oh! You mortals are so arrogant. So full of hubris to think that you could think your deaths could be painless, could be easy, that I wouldn't want my twist of the knife, my final little bit of fun. Well, that was fun. And I do think insect would pair nicely with burnt heretic flesh. Oof, or maybe just soot at this point. But that does beg the question, what should I have for dessert? Any ideas? No, 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 no. no. No, 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 Sean, Bronwyn, Opal, no, no. It's a bad, it's a bad dream. It's bad, it's a bad dream. This isn't how it's supposed to go. We were supposed to change everything. We were supposed to, we were supposed to change everything. It's not how this is supposed to go. No, we were, we were gonna save, we we're gonna save people. We were gonna save people. Get up, get up. Please, get up. And Rune, this entire time, the devil hadn't looked at you. Not once. But now, he turns his fire-red gaze upon you, and for the first time since meeting him, because he wants you to, you understand on a visceral level the expression that's playing across his face. Disappointment. So, this is what the heretics have to offer in the end. A coward. Oof. Really? Seriously? Gods! What a catastrophic disappointment. Look at you, you're quaking in your boots. I would have hoped for a less pathetic final morsel. And for the first time since descending from the ceiling, the devil takes a step forward. His perfect foot crests off the altar and lands on the surface of the dais toward you. Rune, and there it is again as his foot lands that sensation of falling, of descending rapidly and quickly within yourself, the walls of memory rising up around you like quicksand, and your life flashes before your eyes. What do we see? It's such a small life. It's so small and so sad. A brief moment of being born in a dirty room with dirty rags. A flash of hands passing 
blankets over their body, hands teaching them how to hold an axe before a fork. They see themselves grow, skinned knees, and they take their first fall when a rope snaps, caught by a net. They see potato stews. So many small things. Books with all the pages torn out in a school with no teacher. Such small, insignificant moments. A woman with a beautiful gold breastplate and solid stony eyes walking out of a mine tunnel, their father walking in and never walking out. Xiang on the dais in front of Athamos, the unsighing toil, giving, tithing for every miner who died in that accident, because everyone knew it wasn't an accident. He gave for all of them years off his life. How many must he have given? That moment shines bright like a lit match in Rune's eyes, in the back of their mind. A single moment of fire in their memory, the single moment where they decided maybe they wouldn't have such a small, sad life. The years of training, all of it flitting past them like soot passing through their hands. And they see something so small compared to this, compared to a shadow 60 feet, 600 feet tall. So small next to the life of a god. Oh, I love this part. The part before the death, when your sad little life flashes before your eyes. What did you see, Rune? Nothing worth anything? What have you even done with yourself? What do they even die for? Rune doesn't know how to answer, but they look up. They finally tear their eyes away from those piles of soot where they beg the ghosts to get back into their bodies and be braver than them, light the way for them. And it finally dawns on them how young they are. They're only 18. And they finally look the devil in his face, in his perfectly beautiful, horrible face cold, stone-colored eyes meeting his. And their fingers tremble as they move toward their sword, every link in that chain quivering, but unbroken. I will not Break. <laughs> oh, good. Good, good. I've been wanting a little bit of fun. You know, if all of this was over too soon, I mean, what's the joy in that? Pick up your blades. Pick them up. Raise them. Come on. Show me your form. And Rune draws. And they draw so hard that their knuckles shake bone white. 
and the chain makes this kind of sick music on the floor as their hands rattle as they square their shoulders and they understand that they are about to die their life has been so small they know they know what comes next they know that the second that they take a step forward to fight that they will turn to ash just like everyone else did but a little too late the bravery comes to them but it does come and they want to make him pay they want him to hurt like they hurt I decide when I die. I decide when I die. <laughs> oh, little rune. You'll find out soon enough that the only things that decide anything for you are gods. You decide nothing. We decide everything. Now come. <laughs> Thrust your little needles at me. Let's see how much vigor you have. I decide when I die. And they throw their sword. Almost like an arrow. Uh, out and the chain goes like down their forearm as it repels forward and forward and forward and forward. Like almost like an arrow that they throw. Driving true. Straight and strong. So, Rune. <laughs> you don't have access to divine moves yet. You're not there. You are not there. So instead of attempting to inflict violence, I'm going to ask you to... Are you acting impulsively or not? Is this deliberate? I'll act impulsively. Okay. Okay. So when you act impulsively by throwing that sword forward, describe the emotion that drives you and then answer one of those two questions. I have chosen the origin, the wronged for Rune, and the emotion that drives them is vengeance. And I will answer the advantage that I seize is that for all his gloating, the devil was right. This shouldn't have worked. And the advantage is surprise not so much that rune is attacking him but that it hurts when they do okay uh i'll tell you something you didn't notice until now and then i will answer the other question which is what trouble hits you hard and fast okay the blade shoots forward like an arrow toward him uh and where are you aiming for on his body his beautiful, horrible, perfect face. <laughs> One side of it, yeah. Okay, so the sword, uh, it just it shoots past his face. At first, it almost looks like you missed, right? It kind of shoots past his face. Go ahead. And as it shoots past his face, Rune grabs onto the end of the chain and pulls it. So the end of the blade, almost like a whip, like wobbles and strikes against the side of him. So it's Ooh. like they intentionally missed and then like they whip the chain and pull it to slash him across the face from the side as they pull the sword back to them. Yeah, I think as the, the first shot goes quote unquote like wide, right? The devil lets out a, <gasps> oh, come on. Your form leaves much to be desired. <laughs> Any fighter worth her salt can. And then you whip the chain and it, like the, the sword clangs against the side of his face. And unlike uh freya's daggers the blade doesn't break it doesn't shatter against his face it just kind of it does bounce off but it doesn't break and there's a noise like clanging like instead of hitting flesh your sword hit like steel it's like it sings there's like a ding noise and the devil blinks and then he bleeds a bright uh gold wound just 
splits open like the gill on a fish uh, across his left cheek and he starts bleeding gold down the light brown fresco tile of his skin down his beautiful neck down his clavicle and disappearing underneath the hem of that white robe he blinks he looks kind of off to the left side lifts up a perfect hand and touches the gold blood huh and I'm now going to tell you the thing you didn't notice until now. Which is this 10 foot tall, beautiful angel of a devil is not his true form. And now you start to see a spark of that true form brimming up in response to this impossible injury you have dealt him. His eyes, that those crimson flames, burn. They burn bright, bright, bright. And the whites of his eyes turn black, both of them. Like the shadow that was behind him spreads out and fills it. And it's just like two pits of fire burning within an endless abyss. And the shadow peels itself off of the cathedral wall behind him and wraps itself around him. And where the shadow cuts in, uh, we see that beautiful fresco-like tile turn to this pure black nothingness. Like he turns into just a silhouette, uh, an abyss cut into the form of a man. Uh, but the wings, the feathery ones and the bat ones remain intact. Uh, and those eyes continue to burn red, red, red. And when he opens his mouth, uh, his mouth is pure red, right? Like as he speaks, you just sort of see fire sort of flapping open and closed, open and closed. And you also see, I think, uh, cracking open under underneath his sternum, like a pure red flame. It just kind of erupts upward, right? Uh, and like burns where his heart, question mark, should be but it's kind of like seeing a flame in the pit of the mouth of a cave uh there it is burning inside his rib oh well that's impossible who taught you to do that hmm you little mortal insect he did and rune does not relent now that their body has been forced into action, they move tirelessly. The same kind of strike upward that Freya was doing when she came down at the devil, rune mirrors like a, like, like a perfect mirage, half a step behind her, like a ghost of her guiding their hand up and down as they have moved in. Suddenly they are so so close to him as they bring that other half of the sword down and the one like like the chain with the whip swings out behind him and rune brings it over the top of their head to come like an another slash down and they do not relent so i'm gonna now answer the question what trouble hits you hard and fast uh -oh. as, as you are arced in the air with your sword swinging down, this like impossible adrenaline brimming through your body on the, br on the precipice of death, the now shadow wrapped devil, there are parts of his body that aren't covered in the shadow. They're like ribbons of like a uh, light brown skin peering past like this, uh, this wrapping of void across him, right? He looks like layered uh he just casually with a kind of like a disdain and disgust he backhands you uh and you just you fly through the air and you crater into the western wall and dust erupts upward and like bits of marble uh start like uh littering onto the ground i need you to mark four strain Okay. So this is going to be combined. Okay. I didn't hit you with strain earlier. I should have. This is going to be combined emotional toll and also this physical backhand. Uh -huh. So you have one, Ew. one strain pip left. <laughs> one strain box left. Uh huh. As Rune craters into the back wall and their shoulders slump down their fists still shaking around the hilts of their sword uh bruised bloody 
so small and so insignificant compared to this god, this beast, this devil, the devil. And Rune lay in that heap of... Uh, uh, I will not... Wait, you don't get to decide where we die. You don't get to decide where we die. <laughs> Is that all you have? <laughs> what sloppy work. <laughs> oh, come on. Diang was light years ahead of you. So was Reyna and Freya and Aaliyah. <laughs> Even Opal had potential. All I see here is desperation. This is what the heretics have to offer me. This impudent, arrogant little bug. And as Rune opens their eyes and, and shakes their head, after having cratered the back wall of this cathedral, I think like blood spilling down over one of their eyes as they look up, try to blink the blood out of it. Something else starts to layer itself over this moment, like a dream come to life. In one side of Rune's vision, everything completely red, soaked with blood. And, and they're, they're there, they're standing there. Like they're on a street, a normal street, quiet street except for all the people walking and there they are there's opal there's Braith, alia reyna freya bronwyn all of them walking all of them standing there and rune blinks trying to get the blood out of their face and then and then i think there's uh, there's screaming they can hear they can still hear the screaming now rising rising to a fever pitch behind their brain and it's like everything inside them is hot and they can see where it's coming from the fire in the center of the devil's chest that thing that's where the screaming is coming from that's where the screaming is coming from they need it to stop they can't listen to it anymore and rune pushes themselves up off the ground like a wraith, like a, like a devil come to life, crawling up out of hell. They stand and with one final jab, they pull back and plunge that sword deep into the fire as hard as they can. And they look up. <laughs> I decide when I die. You're aiming for the fire at the center of his chest in his shadow form. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are now going to trigger the move. Well, hmm. Okay, before that happens, before that happens. Actually, no, do it. Okay, okay, okay. We're ready. We're ready. We are now going to trigger the crucible move kill a god so when you confront a god in their true form the devil is showing you his true form now it's this shadow wrapped angelic divinity and you exploit their downfall to kill them hmm see tell me what do you think the devil's downfall is based on all the information you have so far and if it's right you can use this move if it's not no dice I think the devil's downfall <laughs> is this arrogance that he makes the deals. He doesn't just, he, he's not an equal part of the deal. He writes the contract. He's the devil. He creates the foundation for the deal. He's not an equal participant. There's no part of him that is an equal participant. He is the conductor of all of it you know what what i had written down was hubris 
So I think that's pretty on the money. Uh, how do you slay him? As Rune's sword plunges into his chest, that fire explodes around both of them. That immolation wraps both of them up in this whirlwind of fire and flame and screaming ghosts. Every single ghost that the devil has ever consumed roars out of his body. Every single lost soul that the devil has eaten drives Rune's fist deeper and deeper and deeper into the center of his chest until their hand is gripping his heart. And Rune on fire, both of them on fire, it doesn't even hurt. I decide when I die. And now I say we both go and <clears throat> all the way in. The last thing the devil says to you before he dies, his, for a fragment of a second, you are face to face. He's 10 feet tall, but you've launched himself, yourself up to their torso, and now you're face to face. For a fraction of a second, on their expression, you see an emotion light up in the devil's eyes. An emotion you don't understand. Uh, an emotion that is, that is incomprehensible to you in that moment of adrenaline and fear and rage and desperation. And paired with that emotion, he says, Ha 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 See you in hell. Boosh! And the devil explodes in a column of flame. And that shadow flays itself off of him. It propagates like a black nuclear cloud across the cathedral walls behind you. And the windows shatter. And the pews shatter. And the altar shatters. And you are flung backward. Uh, a dozen feet. Two dozen feet. And you, you smash into the ground, into the carpet. Your back skidding across broken, stained glass. Your skin burning. Your hair burning. And you tumble once, twice, three times before you crunch to a halt at the base of a pew. And I need you to roll that 2d6. It's a flat roll. Seven to nine is a hit. Six or below is a miss. 10 plus is a strong hit. You're gonna use physical dice? Okay, go for it. I, I, brought, my, I yep. brought my home game dice. Here they are. Seven. Six and a one. High and that low. That is a hit. That is a f that is a hit. So on a hit, they seize something vital from you as well. Name what vital part of yourself you lose. Oh fuck. I lose my community. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The devil has my ha connections. Yep. My bonds. My family. Yep. Yes. Finally, that last part of the move, regardless of your role, you seize a semblance of their power. We'll resolve what that means in a second, because Rune, you black out. In the darkness, in the shadow, in the twilight between life and death, you dream. You dream of a street. Yes, that street. A busy street. A city street. Somewhere in the cradle, somewhere you've never been and yet have always 
known. A street as long as time. A street as wide as space. A street hedged in by buildings the height of the sky. A street overflowing with people. There are people here, Rune. So many people. Hundreds. Thousands. Millions of people. Walking down this infinite road, this endless boulevard. There are people of every gender, every size, every age. So many people. More people than you've ever known in your entire life. And then some. But somehow the street doesn't feel cramped. It also doesn't feel too big. It feels just right. Just right for this many people as it always has been, as it is, as it always will be. You, Rune, are on the sidewalk. You're not in the street, walking with the people. You're simply observing them. The act of watching them is almost calming, actually. There's something reassuring about this street. You've never been here, but you've always known it, and maybe someday you will come here. Rune, as you watch these people mill, a realization starts to dawn on you. Every single person on this street is walking in the same direction. They are always moving from one end of the street toward the other. And as this realization sinks in, the ebb and flow of these people begins to slow down until every single infinite person comes to a halt. And you realize why. A shadow falls over the street the size of a star and then rounding the corner floating several dozen feet above the people in the street is the skeleton of a massive headless serpent. It swims through the air toward the frozen people coming from the direction they're headed and it begins to approach you on the sidewalk. And then the people in the street all start to turn around and they run. They begin to run back the way they came and terror and panic is starting to set in and the headless snake god is swimming through the air and a sensation of sorrow, Rune, wells up inside your bones, a sensation of sorrow and grief and guilt and doom and rage and you gasp awake. You gasp awake from the dream you've had every single night for the last seven years. You're in your bedroom, which is barely larger than a closet, and you're staring at the ceiling. You're covered in sweat. It's your father's birthday. Alexios is turning 60. And this is the last off day you'll have before your shift in the mines starts tomorrow. Tell us, what do you look like seven years later after the dead zone? And what have you been up to? I think we see Rune from behind, silhouetted by a very, very small, thin pillar of light that comes through the only window into their room. It's a concrete slab with a mattress on the floor. This light from somewhere outside, kind of cold and white, that pulls down on their exposed back. You can see burn scars crawling up their scapula, across their shoulders, down their spine, and curving underneath their pectoral muscles, these bright, shining pink scars from top surgery. They got a good trade on it. They like it. Enrune shifts. More muscular now. Older now. They shift on the mattress, pulling themselves up, sitting. And from the back, we can see that their brown hair has 
gotten a little bit longer, still kind of wavy now, slick with sweat. So we pull around, we can see some of the hair at the front of their face has turned a little bit white. Streaks of it now painted like frost framing their face. Their eyes are closed, they're rubbing their temple, the calluses on their hand still firm. Everything in here is kind of cold and dark. And Rune moves with the same, with the same energy, cold and dark. You're still working as a heretic. Rekja needed all the help that she could get after they lost 21. Rune goes out on missions, doesn't really do what they're told most of the time. They work in the mines for nine months out of the year. They tithe when they have to. They pull themselves up out of bed and let the blankets kind of fall loosely around their ankles. All bitten with holes from moths. They kind of stagger over to a small bathroom and the light turns on, blinks a few times. This low buzz starts to hum. And as the camera pans around, I see the rune looking at themselves in the mirror. As they blink their eyes open, still sweaty, you see that one of their eyes is that cold stone gray, like iron, like a sword's blade. And the other is bright red, bright burning crimson. They stare at themselves in the mirror. They kind of shuffle with their shirt, pull out a box of cigarettes, same brand. Coins own everything, really. Any food that gets shipped out this far, coin brand, cigarettes. They pull one out, unlit, and they press it to the tip of their finger. They don't even watch. And as the cigarette butt is pressed there, it begins to burn against their finger until it's lit. Rune pulls away and takes a low drag and pushes the smoke against the mirror until they can't see themselves. You smoke inside the bathroom until there is a quick rap at the door. You recognize it. It is the uh, very stern knocking of your grandmother, Penny. Rune, Rune, what did I tell you about smoking in the bathroom? The window's open. It's not good for your lungs. Yeah, neither is coal dust. Well, it's not good for the shower curtain either. Got a good trade on that. Fine, fine. And Rune runs it out of the water. They didn't really even ever take a drag. They just checked to see if it burned like they do every morning. And it does still. It still burns. Mm. I have a question for you, Rune. Does your grandmother know what you can do? No, nobody the, does. The fire? Oh, okay. Oh, this is something you keep secret? Nobody knows. Okay. Nobody knows what happened. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's fucking go. Yes. Uh, your grandma knocks again. Thank you, Rune. Will you be a dear and hurry up? Everyone's almost here. Yeah, no, I'm... I'll be ready in a second. Okay. Wash up a little. We have a bit more water allocated for this week. Rune doesn't reply. What do you do with your remaining time in the bathroom before you step out? At this point, now that they've checked, they've checked that their eye is red, 
It is. They've checked that their skin burns if they touch something with enough intention. Every morning they check. And now that they know, they avoid looking at themselves in the mirror. They hurry themselves. They put on their clothes. They gather their sword, which is never farther away from them than arm's reach could take them. They make sure it's always on them. And when they're ready, they finally push their way out of their room, out of the dark. You step out into the corridor of your home, which is a one-bedroom apartment, and that's being generous. Uh, you don't have the one bedroom. You have the closet. and Your grandma Penny uh, has the bedroom, which she shares with your father, Alexios. And the corridor you step out into from the bathroom is barely wide enough for a single person. But the living room, uh, which is also the dining room that you now step into, has a little bit more space. Your grandma is in the middle of setting the table, uh, and upon which rests a six-inch vanilla cake. A tiny little cake, which is very rare here. And on the face of this cake, there is just enough room Sorry, one second. Okay, cool. Uh, I was just checking something tech-wise. I'm going to just repeat that. <clears throat> and on the face of this cake, there is just enough room to squeeze out in green frosting HBD Alexios 60 uh, with an exclamation point at the very end. And your grandma, we now see her. She is a hardy old woman with a deceptive amount of muscle. And she kind of like gestures for you to come over to the table. Uh, and her wiry white hair is pulled into a bun. And she is wearing an apron with a rabbit embroidered on it that is being chased by a coyote that is being chased by a lion. And your father, Alexios, is also seated at the table. I. Uh, you got your hair and your temperament from Alexios. At least, that's what everyone says. You've never really known Alexios to be vibrant enough to become emotive. And he's always kind of been this shell of a man <laughs> for as long as you've known him. Tsiang had been the one to step in and fill that parental figure in your life. But sometimes your grandma will tell you, kind of half sadly, half happily, that back when Ezra was alive, Alexios was the life of the party. But Ezra, of course, isn't around anymore. He's never been around. All you know of him is the picture framed in hand-carved wood, mounted on the tiny little shrine in the kitchen that your grandma's tended to ever since you were little. You got your eyes from Ezra, or at least one of them now, the slate gray one. Your eyes and your smile. That's what your grandma always said. And now your grandma is gesturing for you to join herself and Alexios, who is kind of staring at the cake without looking at it. What do you do? Rin sits. In kind of a quiet huff. Pulling, I think, sitting at the table with a sword and half a, you know, piece of pauldron that's welded onto their shoulders. You know, it's plenty of room. Huh. What did you trade for this? Oh, it looks good. You don't have to worry about what I traded. I'm going on shift tomorrow. I'll make sure that whatever you spent on it, I can get back for you. Oh, uh, well, okay. Well, if, you, if you can get back um, two loaves of bread and some paint. Okay. Molly owes me from an old favor. I'll, um, I'll make sure. Can cats have cake? And I think there's kind of a croaky meow from the corner of the kitchen as Beetle and Bug kind of curl underneath Rune's chair. Uh, and I think Bug hops up onto their lap just automatically. And seven years later is a little gray around the ears and their whiskers are a little like curled, you know, but their meow is strong and rumbly as Rune, like, inspects the cake. Can they have some? Oh, oh, they can have a little cake as a treat. How about a little bit of frosting after we cut in? Sure. Sounds good. Would you like that bug? Meow. Meow. 
And like they start to purr and rub up against you. Rune, notably, has not spoken to their father yet today. Uh huh. And neither has he. Uh huh. Uh, Penny sort of claps her wrinkled hands together. Very well. I think Rexha should be joining us soon. She wanted to give her best to you, Alexios, for your big 6 0. Oh, Rune, <laughs> wipe that look off your face. Come on. I'm going on a shift later. She doesn't have to show up. Of course she's coming. Well, she said she had some news she wanted to share, too. I oh, I'll, I'll get the cake knife. Mm. And your grandma, like, kind of totters back into the kitchen and starts, like, rummaging through, like, a drawer, leaving you, the cats, and your dad alone at the dining table. <laughs> and your dad is still kind of just gazing blankly at the cake, um, like, one burly arm kind of on the table, uh, the other one just, like, draped down by his side. A beetle jumps into his lap, but he doesn't react at all. Rune busies themselves. Uh, I think they like take a little bit of frosting from the side of the cake uh, and feed it to uh, Bug uh, and then try to like fix the icing so that their grandmother doesn't notice that they've already taken some to give to Bug. They like kind of uh, busying themselves with this task mm -hmm. instead of making conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Beetle actually, I think, uh, seeing this, jumps up onto the table like in front of Alexios and his plate and starts like sniffing at the cake dangerously close uh beetle beetle uh-uh come here beetle rune gets him off the table yeah pause off pick him up kitty cat and he sort of like lands on the ground your dad is like a statue he like has not moved has not reacted this entire time like beetle got on his lap onto the table he did not react nothing and then Penny comes back, your grandma, with a, a cake knife in hand. And she, like, uh, turns to Alexios. Uh, Alexios, would you like to? I mean, it, it is your birthday. Um. And finally, your dad kind of, like, tears his gaze away from the cake. And he looks up at Penny. Mm. And he reaches out and takes the knife. Uh, and he, f he finally moves. He sort of like leans over the cake and cuts into it. Uh, like uh, just one slice down and he starts to like like pull out a slice. Uh, as that happens, Vroon, is there anything in particular you're doing, you're saying to Penny, you're saying to the cats, or anything, anything in particular? Vroon watches the knife go in and there's something like low and deep in their chest that resonates when... It pierces, but they they push that away as fast as they can. So I think like we we sort of like montage through like a, a little breakfast of the two of you uh, of the three of you just kind of like eating cake uh, for like maybe like 10, 15 minutes pass. Your grandma, God bless her heart, she tries her best to uh, make a conversation, <laughs> but like nothing really happens. She's like, uh, Alexios, uh, how, how, how were the mines your last shift? Mm. Fine. Ah, ah. Rune, I hope you're staying out of trouble with heretic business. What business, Gran? You're not supposed to know about that. <laughs> right, of course. Of course. Well, you do know they did want me <laughs> for a while there, but um, obviously things didn't work out. So you always say, you know, you can still join. You talk uh, about it every time it comes up. No, no, no. It's it's. <sighs> you know how I feel about you being with the heretics. It's it's not safe. And at that rune, clenches their jaw a little. And they force a smile. It's perfectly fine. It's just as safe as any other aspect of living in the cradle. Rune, there's nothing shameful about just being a minor. I am just a minor. Rune! There's a knock at the door. It is not a familiar knock. It is too... Formal to be another person from Iron Forty Two, like another minor. 
It's also not coded like Rekja's or the other heretic Noxar. It's also not angry like Sword's Noxar. This is an entirely new knock to you. What do you do? Rune freezes immediately. Like in whatever, in the middle of whatever, like pretend argument that they have with their grandmother every other few days. And they freeze completely. And I think the whole room goes silent. Even Bug and Beetle are quiet. I'll check. And Rune gets up and like one of their swords comes out of their belt. Uh, the chain still beautiful, still intact. The last memory of that connection dangling at their hip as they move towards the door. Who is it? Uh, they're, hmm. I can just open it. Yeah, no, I think, I think you can say who is it maybe as you're opening it at the same time or do a, like, do you have a peephole? No, there's no people. <laughs> this is this is like a concrete square in a hole in the ground <laughs> where Rune lives. Uh -huh. uh, so there's no people. Rune, I think, instead of calling out, um, they'll just kind of shimmy to the side of the door and like listen to hear who's breathing on the other side. Okay. Uh, I'll just give it to you. You hear a kind of like ambient uh, a, a clinking of plate armor. But it's not like swords plate armor of just like the, the half plate, right? It, it sounds like expensive. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. It sounds really expensive. It sounds well made. And whoever's wearing it seems large. It's just kind of like a, you know, clink, clink. Like they seem to be ambiently just breathing as they're standing there. Uh, and you don't hear anything else. Maybe there's just one person there. Rune looks over their shoulder and, like, looks at their grandmother with a, like, what the fuck did you trade for this? Well, nothing. I don't know what... Well, come on, be a good guest. Maybe maybe it's one of Alexios's friends? He doesn't have friends. Rune pulls the door open with that little jab. You open the door, and standing before you are not one, but two people you've never met before in your life but whom you recognize immediately. The speaker of the above, servant of the witness, the tongue of truth, and behind her, her champion, Sir Eos. And we're going to end the session there. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to the the very first live recording and the only live recording of episodes one and two of God Killer First Blood, the official podcast companion to the God Killer Ash Can release. I have been your game master and creative producer, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. A quick little outro before going into some outroduction announcements and then a raid. Uh, so see, why don't you tell folks where to find you who you are? Oh my god, absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is C. I use they, them pronouns. You can find me making very trans, very gay art on the internet at Pie Sharp Art. If you liked what I did here tonight, you're going to like what I do other places. Most notably, you can find me here on Transplaner. I am a co-producer and cast member here on Transplaner. Uh, I will be your rune for the rest of this God Killer First Blood series. So if you're interested in their story, want to see where they go, because technically that was a flashback. Um, because God Killer starts with the first God you kill. It's been seven years. If you want to know more about Rune's future, not just their past, their present and their future, tune in every Tuesday and Thursday for edited podcast episodes starting on May 2nd. Uh, those will be completely podcast only format uh, with deliciously crafted edits, background music, and a healthy dose of SFX. I'm so sorry you have to wait that long. That means you can look at the incredible art. I'm going to do a quick shout out. Um, Namari Konda is our artist for First Blood. They have done an incredible, incredible job uh, with the art for Rune. Eos and Antigone. Uh, so check it out. There's lots of little teasers in there for you to check out and to look at. So adore the art. Please go follow Conda uh, as soon as you can. They are a fantastic artist and it was such a pleasure working with them on this project. Um, I'm so excited for you all to meet uh, Rune and Eos and Antigone moving forward. Uh, so with that out of the way, I'll pass back to Connie.
Aelson who? Aelson who? What was that? What's the speaker's name? I guess we'll have to find out in May. Or if you're a sharp-eared listener, maybe you caught what C said. Uh, but yes, so every Saturday, like C said, from now through the end of May, May 20th, hosting those God Killer one shots. So tune in every Saturday at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time right here to see other people's takes on this game and this setting and this universe, their own spins on what a God Killer setting could look like. Uh, but yeah, I think that's it in terms of introductions, unless I'm missing any announcements, C. I don't I don't think so did you do the introductions for next week for yes. next week oh my god yes yes thank you for the reminder so uh next week i am so excited to announce that same time same place b dave walters as the god and miss gina darling as the god killer are going to take on their version of the cradle and find out if it's possible for a god killer to escape hell so that's going to be april 8th saturday 8 p.m u.s eastern time right here on twitch.tv slash transplaner rpg uh so excited to share that with you all and we're now going to raid someone really awesome so let's send some love over to Fawn and Games. Uh, use the raid message in chat. Tell them what we were up to. Tell them your favorite part of the session and then throw some love over to them. I believe they are playing uh, uh, Chia. I'm not sure what that is, but that looks like a lot of fun. And uh, again, follow us on the internet, TikTok for myself by Connie Chong and uh, Pie Sharp Art for C. And with that, we love you all so much. See you next week, same time, same place. And Pijo, Pijo. And make sure that you pre-order God Killer. Oh my God, yes. The game is, you can pre-order it now. So he's actually by God Killer in chat. It's the game I wrote. Uh, yeah, okay. Bye.